Welcome to Applied Mathematical Finance. So today I like to discuss the valuation of our yeah, simple interest rate options. So what we did last time was we moved to a session where I had a collection of definitions of say some important interest rate options. So products that are no longer linear in the underlying. So where we have some, yeah, for example, piecewise linear, some maximum of L minus K and zero payoff inside. Um, I already mentioned that this collection here is a bit important because these are the actual interest rate uh, options traded on the market. But um, also there is was another aspect. Uh, these are products where we can still derive a valuation formula analytically. So while for the first session uh, that was here on products without optionality, we could define or state the value uh, by just assuming a static replication or considering a static replication. So we could just state the value without assuming a model for the underlying stochastic processes. Here we need to state a model. And if we state, say, a specific model, yeah, say some kind of simple model, we can derive analytic formulas. And but these models do not reflect the reality very accurately. Yeah, for example, Black Scholes model, a very simple example, a single model parameter, the volatility parameter. But uh, these um, analytic formulas are then important because sometimes they are just used to quote, yeah, so to express the price that you observe in terms of parameter that extracts a little bit of properties from the price that you observe because the price contains several aspects. Yeah, So where is the forward rate? Uh, and uh, for example, where is the interest rate curve? Where's the zero copper bond? But the option then depends on the volatility. So it extracts uh, the relevant parameter. Yeah, in our collection, we saw the caplet, which is just like a call option on the forward rate. Uh, we also saw shortly the digital caplet. Then we had the swap chain, which is an option on a swap. So there was a slight difference here in how we write it. It is an option on the value that I observe at the exercise date of the option. And we also looked at some foreign currency things. There's the foreign caplet. So a caplet I observe on the foreign market converted, yeah, its payoff converted to my currency. And there is the quantum caplet where I have the payoff of a foreign caplet, but just in my home currency. Yeah? So it is a bit strange. I multiply here an amount M in the foreign currency. I convert that to my domestic currency. So I have a domestic currency amount, which I multiplied with a foreign currency interest rate. So I like to state the classic valuation models, Black Scholz model, Bachelier model. And before I do this, let me shortly review how you derive Black Scholz model for a European stock option. Huh? So classic uh, equity model. Uh, and the reason I, that I would like to review this is first, you also have now in the script, the full derivation, including how you calculate the expectation, the corresponding integral. Uh, but second, um, we will move then to a generalized Black Scholes formula by recapitulating this proof and taking out the essence of the proof, which will be immediately applicable to our situation. Because if you just look at the derivation as you find it in the equity section of your textbook, then there are some assumptions, for example, that you have deterministic interest rates, yeah, which clearly do not hold in our situation. And yeah, the generalized Black-Scholz formula, which we will 
than half uh, is even much nicer to memorize. And you also see, well, a little bit better the underlying structure yeah, that uh, staying helpful in, valuation, uh, in valuing or also the other interest rate options. So let's go through this quickly. Okay, so repetition, like Schultz formula for an equity option. So we have a market that consists of two assets. My two assets is B, which is the bank account, and S, which is the stock. For the bank account, my model is that it has an instantaneous interest rate. So there is here an interest rate R of T and we have continuously compounded bank account. So it is DB is R of T, P of T, DT. So you immediately know the solution. So assuming that initial value is equal to one, my solution is this one currency times E to the RT if R is a constant or E to the integral from zero to T R of tau D tau. So that guy is easy and it is also our natural candidate later for a numeria. So for the stock, I assume a log normal process. So it is an eto stochastic process and it's log normal because I assume that I have here a coefficient s and here coefficient s. So actually that you have this coefficient s here in, in the drift is a consequence. Yeah, so maybe, maybe more general to so just state you have some average drift or some, some uh, arbitrary drift and uh, we later can conclude that actually under the equivalent martingale measure, we will see a mu times s. Okay, but so the important part is that we assume it has this diffusion coefficient, so a sigma s dw. So sigma can depend on time, but is deterministic. What I like to do, I like to value the payoff of the call option. So there is S of capital T, so at a future point in time, and I like to value pay maximum S of T minus K and zero. I like to find the value in zero. So that is V of zero, and we know the universal evaluation theorem that we can move to the equivalent martingale measure. So we can move here to the Q superscript N, under which with a given numeraire N, all traded asset divided by the numeraire are martingales. So also our derivative here is um, a martingale. So how do we move to the QN? So we use Kirsanov theorem that we know moving to the equivalent martingale measure modifies the drift of the stochastic process. The martingale property states that the drift of the relative prices has to be zero. So we can derive how the processes look like under this measure QN, the processes of the relative prices, for example, S divided by B, yeah, if B is my number are uh, martingales. So we do not derive the measure, we derive how the processes look under the measure. Once we have this, we observe that what's here under the expectation is then a function of my stock, because that here is maximum of S of T minus K. So a function of the stock and my chosen numeraire. So I make the numeraire here blue because I will choose the B, but actually you can also derive this stuff by choosing S as numeraire. Yeah? There will be the same outcome. Uh, so you think, okay, S divided by S is always a martingale, yeah? but then also B divided by S has to be a market martingale, which implies a specific drift for the S. And then the formula that pops out is exactly the same. Um, if we know how the process looks under this measure, in some cases, we can derive the distribution of the terminal random variable that enters here. So 
this stuff here being a function of these guys, we can derive the distribution of these guys analytically. And even better, we can solve then this expectation here analytically. So we can solve this analytically. I know the density and I can solve the integral. So that's the, the program that you hear usually do. And for the equity case, the natural choice, as I already mentioned, for the numeraire is the B. And this is a bit special because that will do the following. It will allow you to move this guy here out of the expectation. Okay, why? Yeah, because I already know that B of capital T B of capital T is this guy here. This is not random. It's a constant. Yeah, so I can move it here out of the expectation, which has the nice property that then inside here, there's only a single function of S. Recall that we would like to move to applying this to interest rates. For interest rates, our numeraire in even here in that case would be stochastic. Yeah? So there would be a forward rate here and there would be a stochastic numeraire here. So you have the expectation of a product of two random quantities. There is correlation covariance inside. You cannot move it out. So the equity case is hiding this problem. And it's also then hiding how you solve this problem. But let's move on. So um, we move to the equivalent martingale measure. So we move to the equivalent martingale measure, which means that by Gersanov, the drift is modified. Yeah, so that we have here Gersanov theorem. And we know from the martingale property that the D S divided by B, yeah, so B is now my numeraire. This is a process that has a zero drift. Okay, so this is a DW here. Okay, so let's check what is DS divided by B. So that is then the next thing. The next thing is that we use here Eto's lemma. So all the ingredients are Kisanov, Martingale property, Ito's lemma. So from Ito's lemma, first order term, yeah, ds multiplied with one divided by b. You can move the s divided by b in front. S times d one divided by b. Okay, this gives you a minus one divided by b rt. Yeah. Okay. So these here are the first order terms from Ito. And these here are the second order terms from Ito's lemma. And they are all zero, yeah, because you have a dt times dt, dw times dt, dt times dt. They are all zero because we have two stochastic processes, S and B, but the B only has a dt part. So if B would have a dw part, there would be a term dw dw in the um, second order term, or there could be such a term. Yeah? So there could be a non-zero second order term. So you see also here that the fact that the B is a deterministic thing yeah, is very helpful, yeah? is making the stuff easy. Yeah? That could be different. So collecting the terms, you see that you have that our mu in the mu times SDT has to be equal to the R. No? So it is DS is R S DT plus sigma S DW under QN. Now we know first step the stochastic process under QN, but I would like to derive an analytic formula. So I know here this guy, and I know that now my mu here is an R. Second step, to derive the analytic formula, I use Ito's lemma again. And I observe that 
the TS is a RS TT plus sigma SDW. So it has here some ugly random, yeah, so non constant coefficients. But I can move to DS divided by S, which gives me RDT plus sigma dw. And this here looks very much like a derivative of the logarithm. So what I introduce is a new variable. So for my s, my stochastic process s, I introduce now logarithm of s as a new variable, as a co new coordinate. So I'm looking here at the y, which is the log of s. So instead of looking at the ds, I look at the dy. But from Ito's lemma, you get another second order term. Yeah, So it is not that dy is ds divided by s. There is another second order term, a ds ds term. And this second order term gives you then here in Ito's lemma, the ds ds term, this um, correction term. Yeah, So it's actually one half ds ds divided by s squared. So it will, will be a one half sigma squared. Time. I assume you all uh, know this. Yeah? So d log of s looks like that. And the nice thing is that on the right hand side, I have now only deterministic coefficients. Yeah? If 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 they would not depend on t, yeah, it it would be immediately clear. But uh, if they depend on t, okay, I just can introduce here the value of the integral. So with respect to the with respect to the drift part to the R, I introduce the integral R dt, and with respect to the diffusion part, the sigma, I introduce. Okay, this is the I two isometry. Yeah, so I integrate sigma d w. Yeah, so you know the result is a normal distributed random variable where we actually scale with the square root of integral sigma squared. Okay, having these two quantities, I know the terminal distribution of log s of t because I just integrate here from zero to t. Yeah? So this gives me the log s of t. So integrating this guy from zero to t, integrating the log s gives me log of s of capital T minus log of s of zero. So the minus log of s of zero, I move it to the other side. So it pops up here. And then I have actually the two integrals, the Lebesgue integral, the stochastic integral. And using now the defined symbol for the solutions, of these integrals, I can write this as log of S zero, my initial value, plus R bar, yeah, R bar now being here the average, okay, I divide by T, multiplied with T, so this R bar T is just the integral over R dT, minus one half sigma bar squared T, Okay, then I still have the stochastic integral, but I know that this here is a normal distributed random variable with mean zero and standard deviation sigma bar square root of capital T. So I know the distribution of log of S of T. And this here is standard normal. So the Z is standard normal. So I even know the density. I like to calculate the expectation. Yeah, so plug all the stuff in. I like to calculate the expectation under my equivalent martingale measure of the payoff. Yeah, the payoff that depends here on S of T. So, but since I know the distribution of log S of T, so this is here my Y my log s of t, I write exponential of log s of t. So I like to calculate the following function 
maximum of the exponential of some variable y, where y is normal distributed, minus k and zero. And you see that my numerator just gives me here this factor. Yeah? So actually the numerator does not interfere with all this calcul calculation. Knowing the density, you can plug this in now. My random variable log of s, so this is here my y, my log of s, it has a shifted mean and it has um, yeah, a di different standard deviation. Okay, standard deviation was sigma bar square root of capital T. So this is here my standard deviation of the guy. And there is some shifted mean. So what is the shifted mean? The mu, so some, some uh, change in the mean. So the mu is, okay, what is the mean of this guy? It is actually all this. So it is the initial value plus the integrated drift, including the log adjustment from the Ito's lemma. So also note that here the log S of zero is actually inside this mu here. So now you can solve this integral, yeah, maximum exponential of a normal distributed random variable, minus k and zero, and you arrive at the Black-Scholes formula. And that's it. Okay, it's S of zero times capital phi. Capital phi is the distribution function of the normal, standard normal, um, of d plus minus exponential minus r bar t, k, phi of d minus and d plus minus are here these ugly guys. Okay, not very easy to memorize the formula. Yeah, and also doesn't look very symmetric. There is here this factor from the numerator, but why is it not here? Yeah, this is a bit strange. How do you derive the formula from the integral is here in the script. Let's go very quickly through, through this because it will also maybe appear in the Bachelier again, yeah, and later. Yeah, I have to calculate this integral, maximum exponential y minus k and zero times this density, plug the definition of the density in. Okay, that here is my density. Okay, I plug it in and I get another exponential function under the integral. You can easily get rid of the maximum by just changing the lower bound of the integral because this is the place, yeah, log k, where exponential y becomes larger than k. Okay, so this is getting rid of the maximum. And then you can split the integrals in two parts, okay. So there's a minus here. So you split the integral and the part that has an exponential function in front of the density and that has a constant in front of the density. Uh, for the guy that has an exponential function in front of the density, exponential function times exponential function is an exponential function here with a plus y. Yeah, okay. Actually here with a plus y. And if you like to have it above, it is a plus y times two sigma squared. Actually, since there's a minus here, it is a minus. Okay, so you can, you can move the exponential y you have here, you can move it in the other exponential function and just observe that it is modifying a little bit your density. So then doing a square addition, you can modify the guy that here is on top to something that has a shift in the mean. So it modifies your mu and another constant here on the outside. Yeah, so it is y minus some mu tilde squared minus some other constant. So this constant here, in the exponential function, okay? So you see all this here is inside the exponential function. This can move be moved in front as just an additional 
factor. Yeah? So all that I'm left of is that I get a different factor in front and I get a kind of shift in the mean, a shift with a plus sigma. And this is actually where the D plus minus comes from. Yeah, One guy is shifted with a plus sigma squared, the other guy is not. And actually you express it then in a terms of symmetry, Yeah, half a, half a shift of sigma, half a shift uh, of sigma, uh, of, with, of minus sigma, yeah? And then the mean is shifted by one half. Okay, so you see that the part of the integral that has the exponential function in front becomes just like an integral that has a constant in front with a shifted mean. So I just have to solve this integral and yeah, you could do it like that and shift everything to um, a standard normal. So you can do a substitution yeah, such that here you have the density of the standard normal, or you can immediately observe yeah, that it is the density of a normal distribution with a certain mean and standard deviation. So in the end, you get the phi of t plus or minus yeah, when phi here is the standard normal. Okay, I do some substitution. The substitution changes here, of course, the bound. Yeah. And it also changes um, a factor in front. And then you have here the density of the standard normal. So the two integrals are just the same and you arrive at this solution here. So one guy gets a factor in front that came from our square addition together with a little shift here in the mean, yeah, and the other one had the K in front. So that is the Black-Scholes formula. Small remark, yeah, we'll make that later again. Um, you see that this formula, apart from the quantities that you already know from, say, valuing a linear product, here it would be an equity forward, has only one additional parameter. It is the integral of the sigma squared of t. Yeah? And if I would like to annualize it, it is divided by t, it is per year. And then if I like to convert it from a variance to a standard deviation, it is the square root. And this parameter is the Black-Scholes uh, volatility. And what you could, of course, do is you could observe a market price and ask yourself, okay, what is the corresponding Black-Scholes volatility that I would have to use to match this market price? And this is then the market implied volatility. Yeah, so we can use this formula to express the price in a more robust parameter because the price depends on also these other quantities, but the option part only depends on the sigma. My introduction was that I would like to derive a more general Black-Scholes formula that is yeah, also suitable then for our case where my numeraire is stochastic. And going back, we could also introduce a slightly different numeraire. We could have considered M, which is exponential minus R of capital T minus T. So what is this guy? So this guy is M of T. Yeah. So if it depends on T, it depends like minus minus, like E to the R little T. Yeah? So actually this is like the B of T. But it is the B of T divided by the B of capital T. Because you see for little t equals capital T, this M of capital T is equal to one. And this maybe reminds you a little bit of what we had with the linear products. This M is the financial product that encodes my payment time. It is, I pay one unit of currency in M. So the nice thing that 
here is that we are encoding the payment time and we can sync off paying in units of M. Then what do I pay in units of M? Okay, you would say you pay S of T minus K and zero. And from the so maximum in units of M. But I do a similar modification for my S. I now introduce the stochastic process F. F of little t is S divided by M. So the nice thing is that this is also something that does not modify anything here because I have F of capital T is exactly equal to S of capital T because M of capital T is equal to one. So, but what I now pay is I pay a stochastic process that is a martingale under my equivalent martingale measure associated with the numeria M. So you see, I'm transforming now the payoff of the option a little bit toward what we had observed for the linear products. I pay the index L multiplied with the zero copper bond. So in units of a zero copper bond and the index is a martingale under the equivalent martingale measure of exactly that zero copper bond. If you introduce now these two stochastic processes, which have exactly the same payoff, and you go back to the derivation of the Black-Scholes formula, and you now derive the formula in terms of these quantities, there's a nice little thing, because m of zero, yeah, what is m of zero? m of zero is the e to the minus r capital T. So that's exactly a factor that appeared there. And what is S of zero? S of zero is, sorry, what is F of zero? What is F of zero? F of zero is S of zero divided by the M of zero. So actually here, F of zero times M of zero would be an S of zero, the guy that does not have the factor. But if you now write the formula using these quantities, it looks much nicer. So what you have is you the value in zero of your derivative is f of zero multiplied with phi of d plus minus k times phi of d minus multiplied with m of zero. So this looks very symmetric, yeah? Look, it looks exactly as our payoff at the final point in time. And what is what about the d plus minus? Okay, so here is the ugly d plus minus. So there is here the logarithm of s of zero divided by k. Well, you could move this guy here into the logarithm. Then it would be logarithm of s of zero divided by k multiplied with e to the rt. Yeah, but this is then exactly your f of zero. So also the d plus minus looks much nicer. It is here just logarithm of these two factors that you have here in front, put into a ratio, f of zero divided by k, and then just the shift of one half sigma squared capital T to the left and the right. Very symmetric. If you then go back to the proof, actually you see that the proof relied a little bit on the fact that M is a numeraire and well, also F is a QM martingale, yeah, came in handy. Yeah. So our model is sanctioned on F. So you can go back to the proof and you show that you have the following general situation that M denote a traded asset, which we choose as a numeraire. So we go to QM, let F denote some QM 
martingale and consider the payoff that you pay maximum of f of capital T minus k and zero multiplied with m of capital T, you pay this in T or you observe this value in T. Yeah, Look, uh, remember the swaption where we had that it is an option on a swap uh, and the swap is just the option on the swap value. So you just observe that you have this situation. Then assuming the model for F, df is sigma fdw, so there's no drift appearing because I already know that this guy is a qn martingale, so this is under qn. I have the very nice Black Schultz formula f of zero, which is the forward times phi of d plus minus k times phi of d, d minus m of zero. Again, note the very nice similarity of the functions your payoff. So what do we, we have at time capital T? Yeah, my payoff at time capital T is maximum of f of t minus k and zero. No? So multiplied with m of t. So this maximum here, I can write with an indicator function. So it is f of t minus k multiplied with the indicator function is f of t larger than k. So I have here an indicator function. So I can pull this out. I have f of t times this indicator function minus k times this indicator function. I pay everything here in units of M. This is the payoff. And what happens in the Black Scholes, in my generalized Black Scholes formula in the valuation is that I have exactly the same form. So I pay F times something minus K times something. So I observe the value F times something minus K times something times my M, but now M observed in zero. And the two indicator functions, they have been smoothed. Yeah, because I take the expectation, yeah, so with a heat kernel yeah, or with a, with, a, with a density. So I have some kind of expectation. So it is like some smoothing. So they have been smoothed and also a bit shifted. So there is here the phi d plus and there is the phi d minus. So it looks as we have in this picture, there is the indicator function. And the phi d plus is the cumulative distribution function, which is just a smoothed indicator. Shift it a bit to the left. It's the phi d plus. And the phi d minus is the guy that is shifted a bit to the right. So if f is equal to k, yeah, so you would be exactly here at this jump yeah so there is a value in this difference coming from these little shifts that's a nice formula and suddenly you see that um, the m could also be stochastic and we will see this again because now let's look at Black Scholes formula, for example, for a caplet. And I will go again a little bit through the derivation and you see much clearer why now um, the M can be stochastic. Actually, the reason is that actually you multiply here with the M. And if you then plug it into the expectation, you also do divide by the M and it's removed from the expectation. Let's have a look at this. So first one, black model, black Schultz model for a caplet. Yeah, I consider a single forward rate. Here is my forward rate L for the period from T1 to T2, T2, T2. I just call it L1. I assume again a log normal 
dynamic. So the log normal dynamic important part is my diffusion is a sigma LDW. Actually, there could be a drift to it. So I have a drift parameter under the objective measure. Yeah, so why shouldn't interest rates not have a drift? Okay, could be. I would like to value the payoff profile of my caplet. So I pay a maximum of L minus K times P with length and zero times one unit of currency. And I pay it in observe in T2. Yeah? So there are small differences compared to the equity case. What is the numerea that we choose? Well, I choose the numerea that corresponds to this payoff unit. So I choose the numerea that corresponds to paying one unit of currency in T2. So this is the first little crucial trick in this derivation. And you see that now choice of numerea is important. Yeah, We could not work it out with choosing the numerea PT1, the bond that pays at the beginning. I also have the nice little fact that my L1 is a traded asset divided by the numerea, so it is a martingale. So my L1 is um, a QN martingale. It is drift-free under QN. So now I'm in a similar situation. I know the stochastic process under QN, and the process is also a guy where I know the terminal distribution of L of capital T. So we do the same trick. I move now to the logarithm. The log process has non-stochastic coefficients. So d log is minus one half sigma squared dt plus sigma dw. So I know the terminal distribution. So I know log of L1 at capital T. Well, my capital T will be the T1, the point where I fix it. Yeah? In my payoff, this will be my capital T. For the option, I now have that I pay maximum of L1 of capital T1 minus K times the period length in units of my numerea. Now apply the universal valuation theorem, universal pricing theorem. I have here on top the payoff. And I have here below my numerea. And the nice thing is that I pay in units of the numerea divided by the numerea. So the problem I mentioned before, this is another magic thing here, is disappearing. So it could be that there is a correlation or covariance term. Yeah, Since I have here a stochastic process and my numerea is now also a stochastic process, but I have the special situation that I pay in units of this numerea. So this thing here is canceling such that under the expectation, expectation with respect to my equivalent martingale measure, I now have just a single function of L and I know the distribution of L. The distribution of L is log normal, yeah? so exponential of Y with a normal distributed Y. So it's exactly the same expression as in the equity case. I can solve this expe expectation. I can calculate the integral. So I get exactly the same formula. Yeah, note that I'm in the same situation. Inside my log normal variable, outside my Numerea, yeah? So the nice thing is that the numerea in the valuation formula appears n of zero in front of the expectation and n of capital T in the expectation, but my payoff or my choice of numerea is so special that in the expectation, it is canceled. So these two guys here. 
they have cancelled. I arrive at my generalized Black-Scholes formula. It is my, my forward, the value of my martingale in zero, multiplied with phi of d plus minus k, phi of d minus. d plus minus are exactly the same because it is exactly the same stochastic process. df is also just the sigma f dw in the general case. Here also multiplied with the period length, yeah, because that is just a scaling factor. So then multiplied with my numeria. You could also say you pay in units of period length times the zero copper bond. Yeah? So then that would be your numeria. Exactly the same. Nice formula, easy to memorize. Yeah, if you move to the index being a martingale and the numeria being the payoff unit. Now again, the remark, the value only depends on a single parameter, my now called black volatility, that would be my parameter sigma bar. So square root of one divided by, okay, what now? T1 times the integral from zero to T1, sigma squared of little t dt. Yeah. It is the integral up to t1 because that is the point when you fix this quantity. So the sigma bar that occurs here in my d plus minus yeah, is the sigma bar associated here from integrating up to capital T and the capital T is the T1 because I fix here. Yeah? So don't mix up fixing and, and payment. So that sigma bar is now my black volatility that determines in this valuation formula, the value of the caplet, apart from the quantities, which I maybe already know, the quantities which I already know is maybe the initial value of the forward and the zero copper bond at the end, at the payment time. So these are two other market parameters. Then I have product properties, like what is the strike? Well, the two market parameters L and P are known from the linear products. Sigma is the only one that is left. And you can maybe invert the function. So observing the market price, you can ask yourself, what is the corresponding volatility, and this is then called the implied volatility. Yeah? So calculating sigma from, for a given value is the so-called implied volatility. For the digital caplet, we had the lemma that the digital caplet is just the derivative, partial derivative minus the partial derivative of the caplet value with respect to the strike. So you can carry this out here. You could also plug in instead of the maximum function, the, in, uh, yes, the indicator function and calculate the integral, which is very easy because then you just get one integral of the density with a fixed lower integration bound. Yeah, and you see this is just uh, a phi um, of d minus that pops out. Let's move to the Bachelier model. We can do the same, assuming a different model dynamics for our forward rate L. Yeah? So I have again L1 here, and I now assume a normal dynamics. So it means that my diffusion is just the sigma dw. There's no L in front here. The derivation is now exactly the same. I choose is my numeraire, the zero copper bond that is associated with the payment date. I observe that my quantity is a martingale. I know the stochastic process. Now it is sigma dw under qn. I know now the distribution at a future point capital T. So L is normal distributed, L of capital T is normal distributed. I know the standard deviation yeah, and the uh, mean, Yeah, the mean is just the initial value now. I can plug this in and 
instead of having here, like before, exponential of logarithm of L, which I then have exponential of Y and Y is normal. This exponential of Y is now just the Y. Yeah. So I just have the L because I have a normal one. Plugging this in, we have also the nice feature that the numeraire is canceling out. And I just have a single expectation of maximum of L minus K. Okay. And you can go back to the derivation. So what is different in the derivation? In the derivation is different that in the integral before we had exponential of Y minus K times the density. And now I just have Y minus K times the density. So the K times the density will be very similar. So the K times the density will be very similar. It's just the K times a phi of d plus or something like that. Um, but the other part is maybe not similar because before there was an exponential of y and now there's just a y. So what you do is you do an integration by parts. Uh, doing an integration by parts gives you instead of the phi, the capital phi, the distribution function, the little phi, the density. So there is some little phi popping out here. And then it gives you the same uh, integral again, yeah, but with the same d plus. So I have an L1 minus K capital phi of d plus, plus a part that comes from this integration of parts. Okay, that is how you can then derive the Bachelier formula, yeah, which, which is here. So you see that the shift, yeah, is now not inside here the phi d plus d minus. Yeah, the shift is somewhat outside. Now let's move to an interesting thing. So black model for the Keplet or Bachelier model for the Keplet. Yeah, you could just derive it in the same way. And we saw a little bit that the choice of Numeraire entered. Yeah, but yeah, okay. Now, this is even more important to have here the right choice of numeraire if we look at the swaption. So let's do black model for the swaption. First thing that you may be puzzled. Okay, a swaption is an option on the swap and a swap is just exchanging different forward rates. Yeah, so say L1, L2, L3, L4, against a fixed payment, a fixed rate, say against some S yeah, or K. So you already have multiple possibly stochastic quantities. This looks like you need a complicated model. There is a nice rewriting of our payoff function yeah, or of our value function. So we know the swaption value at the exercise time. So I assume that here we exercise the swaption at the beginning of the first period. So then I know that the value of the swaption is take the maximum of the swap value and zero. So take the swap when it is positive for you. I assume some tenor discretization. Yeah, so like here in our definition for the swap. Okay, so that was the swap. The swap exchanges floating rate against fixed rate. So I assume that the fixed rate, they are all constant. And let's call this constant for the fixed rate. Let's call it K. So my swap exchanges L, I against K, yeah, multiplied with period length, paid at the end of the period. This is the definition here of the swap. It exchanges L against a constant payment S. And the value is 
of the swap at an earlier point in time is the forward rate observed at that earlier point in time minus the constant rate that I pay multiplied with the zero copper bond that pays at the end of the respective period. So the value is the sum over all these valuations. So that's here the value of my swap. L i observed in little t minus S i times period length times zero copper bond that pays at the end of the period. Yeah, what is now my stochastic process that I model and what is the numeria? The first nice thing is that I can rewrite this using the pass swap rate. So recall the definition here of the pass swap rate. So one, seven, four, yeah, so this is one, seven, four. The pass swap rate is the constant rate that puts the swap to zero. So what I have is that L, Li minus the par swap rate, so as par, is a swap that has value zero. So if I multiply now with the period length of the zero cover bond, the sum over all these is zero. So to this here, I can add or subtract this without changing it. Yeah. But if I subtract it, the L is vanishing. So this is a nice thing. Yeah. So I can rewrite the value of my swap as yeah, exchanging the floating rate against the fixed rate. But now I subtract here and add here the pass swap rate to observe that this is just L minus the pass swap rate. So this, this guy here is the pass swap. This guy is zero. So what I'm left with is the pass swap rate minus the swap rate of this swap multiplied with the period length and the bond at the end. So maybe I draw now the pass swap rate here also in green. So now it's maybe a dark green because the pass swap rate is a stochastic quantity. Recall I already mentioned it is somehow an average of the forward rates. Yeah. So you have here inside all stochastic processes observed in little t. So my pass swap rate is a stochastic process. So this guy here is a stochastic process as par minus a constant. So if this constant here is actually my k, then you can move the pass swap rate minus k part now you see it doesn't have a parameter i, you can move it in front of the sum. So I have a very nice representation of my swap. So if I choose si equal to k, so these here are my k's, then I have that the value of my swap is the pass swap rate minus k multiplied with this thing that is actually, okay, it is the payments, payment time encoding. When is this swap rate paid? Yeah? So when is the fixed leg paid? So multiplied with the sum period length times zero copper bond. And this guy had a name, yeah? So this is the so-called swap annuity. And now look at this funny, situation here. I pay S, oops, I pay S minus K multiplied with A, 
A is a traded asset. It is a portfolio of zero copper bond. Yeah. And now the magic, going back to the definition of the pass swap rate, this here is our swap annuity. This here is a portfolio of zero copper bonds, L times P. Yeah, it's the bond at the beginning minus the bond at the end. The pass swap rate is a martingale under the equivalent martingale measure associated with this swap annuity, the payment unit. So this thing is exactly like in the other situations. We pay an index minus K multiplied with a traded asset and the index is a martingale under the nomaria associated with the traded asset. So I can rewrite the swap chain now very nicely, taking the maximum of this and zero, observing that the A is positive, you can move the A out of the maximum. Yeah, you have that we pay maximum of the pass swap rate fixed at the beginning of the first period. So when I value the swap minus K and zero multiplied with the swap annuity. I have a single stochastic quantity inside the maximum. I choose A, which is also stochastic as a numerator. So by this choice, the second stochastic quantity will pop out of the, or will cancel out of the expectation. So I only need a model for this single quantity. I assume again that the pass swap rate is now having a log normal dynamic. So I have here a log normal dynamic for the pass swap rate. And I'm in the situation of the Black Schultz model. So moving to the equivalent martingale measure. Yeah. So moving to the QA, I know the stochastic process for the pass swap rate. So now I just call this guy S and I get again the nice Black Scholes formula. My index S of zero multiplied with the phi of D plus minus K phi of D minus all multiplied with my numeraire at evaluation time A of zero of d plus minus exactly look the same because it is exactly the same stochastic process that is only described by an initial value and this parameter sigma. Bachelier model for a swap chain. Okay, now it's trivial. You just move to the pass swap rate. The numeraire is the swap annuity. We will get exactly the same formula as the Bachelier model for an equity forward. Yeah. So I have now a normal dynamics, a normal model. And I have exactly the same formula here. So Bachelier formula is S of zero minus K times the phi plus plus this part, yeah, sigma times square root of T1 times little phi, the density of T plus, which comes from this integration by parts, all multiplied with A of zero. Black and Bachelier model for a swap chain on a backward rate. Well, also easy, the value of a swap on a backward rate at T1, Equates with the value of a swap on the forward rate. So I can plug in the value of the swap at the forward rate. So I get the black formula or the Bachelier formula for the swap chain on the forward rate. Also for a swap chain on, on, or an option on a swap on the backward rate. I already made this remark, a little warning. This nice property here applies to swap chains. Yeah, it does not apply to caplet, cap and floor lead because caplet, cap and floor lead, they 
are the maximum of the index at payment time. Yeah? So they include an additional time period of volatility and the valuation is then not so easy if you replace the um, forward rate with the backward rate. That was it for this little tour through classic valuation models now applied to my interest rate options. Yeah, classic book, Prigo, Mercurio, where you can also find some, some of this. We have a little time left. And since we are now just in, yeah, in good practice of applying this change of numeria technique, you, you saw that for the swap chain, there was a very special numeria. It is the swap annuity. But you also saw the interesting thing that this numeria really encodes how a swap is paying. Yeah? It is a paying at a collection of different times with a certain fraction of payment um, uh, period lengths. Yeah? So of weightening the amounts. Yeah? That, that's an interesting thing. The numeria is really encoding here the payment in the sense that it's not only encoding the payment time, it is the payment unit. And this is also interesting when we now move to a foreign currency. So let's have a short look at this. I already introduced the foreign caplet. So the foreign caplet now looks even more complicated because I not only have the numeria, which is maybe the zero copper bond at the payment time, and the index, which is my L. So I have here the foreign currency interest rate, the foreign forward rate, and all this is paid at some time, capital T. So there is some payment time. T2, uh, which will lead to the ch choice of a certain number there. But there's also another stochastic process. There is the foreign currency exchange rate. So actually, if I would look from this point on this problem, I would like to I would have to write down three models, yeah? One for the forward rate, one for the zero copper bond when I receive the amount, and one for the foreign currency exchange rate. However, this here is the lucky case where everything is canceling. So let's have a look at this. We assume again, a log normal dynamic for the forward rate. So it's boiling down to a black shorts like formula. So this means I assume that my foreign forward rate has a sigma L tilde DW3. So I denote here the parameter with sigma subscript L tilde. It is the volatility parameter of the foreign interest rate with some drift. And the valuation follows immediately from the valuation of a domestic couplet, a caplet. Um, under the Black Scholes model. And there are actually two ways to see this. The first approach, take the view of the foreign investor. So for the foreign investor, this is just a standard caplet. So the foreign investor is now the problem of valuing this payment here, one foreign currency unit multiplied with maximum of L tilde minus K and zero times the period length. Of course, if he assumes this model, the foreign investor, then the result is just the black schultz formula in foreign currency. So we get some V tilde of zero where the valuation formula is just the formula where all domestic quantities are replaced by the corresponding foreign currencies. So we have a foreign currency value, sorry, 
So we have a foreign currency value, V tilde. And then I can convert this to my domestic currency using here my currency exchange rate, which I observe today to get the domestic currency value V of zero. So it just means I buy a caplet in the foreign currency market by observing the price of the caplet in foreign currency, converting it to my currency. So I expect that I get Black Scholes formula and there is a P tilde, a foreign currency bond. And then in the end times Fx of zero. The other approach to value this is to convert not the value of the financial product to convert the value of the cash flow of the product. So I have the FX rate at time T2, so at the payment time. So I convert the payoff to my domestic currency. So it's V of T2. So this is what I receive at time T2 as a domestic investor. If I own a foreign caplet, yeah, I receive one unit of foreign currency multiplied with the foreign currency interest rate times the period length, yeah, or minus K and maximum of zero of this times the period length converted to my domestic currency. Let's do the valuation stuff. What is the numerator that we choose? Well, the numerator that we choose in the classical capital thing is the bond, the Sukova bond that corresponds to the payment time. So that is the guy that I have chosen in the domestic currency caplet as numeraire. Is this a good numeraire? Well, actually it is not because if you have this numeraire in your um, expectation operator, you will see that the FX here is not canceling. But really look, what is the unit that is paid here? The unit that is paid here for the numeraire is one foreign currency unit multiplied with the FX. So actually this here is the foreign currency zero copper bond that pays in T2, observed in T2, multiplied with the FX of T2. So the payment unit of this is a foreign currency converted to my domestic currency. So the payment unit is the foreign bond, but as a domestic investor, I cannot own a foreign bond. I always own a foreign bond converted to my domestic currency. So you have to be really careful with these conversions. So the thing here is that I choose the foreign bond converted to domestic currency as my numeraire. So here I have, these are all now stochastic processes. So N of little t is P tilde of T2 semicolon little t times Fx of little t. Yeah? So whenever I observe the foreign bond in the other economy, I observe it through my classes that perform the multiplication with the corresponding Fx at observation time. And now comes the funny thing that the L tilde is a few P tilde times Fx martingale. Well, that's, that's strange. Why is that? Okay, I know that L tilde is a P tilde martingale for the foreign investor, right? So wh why is this? Well, the L tilde, say one, yeah, so for the period from T1 to T2, what is it? It is one divided by the period length. Okay, maybe I write this on the top. One divided by the period length. The bond at the beginning of the period 
this is now all the foreign bond minus the bond at the end of the period. So all is the foreign bond divided by the bond at the end of the period. Okay, so, and you see that now if a foreign investor would choose this guy here as numeraire, he would see that this here is a traded asset divided by the numeraire. So L tilde is a Q, P tilde martingale. Well, for me, these guys here are not traded assets. And this is not a possible choice of the numeraire. What I have is as a domestic investor that I have to look through my class where everything is converted to my domestic currency. So what I have is I have the foreign bond converted to domestic currency at the beginning of the period minus the end of the period. And also here, the foreign bond converted to domestic currency. So you see, this is really here equal because these two FXs, they cancel. But now observe, this is a traded asset for the domestic investor. And this is also a portfolio of traded assets for the domestic investor. It's a portfolio of owning foreign bonds. So if you choose now, this guy here is your numeraire. Then you have that L tilde one is a martingale for the domestic investor. But this is a nice, uh, nice uh, tricky little thing, yeah? So uh, you cannot really even choose P tilde as a numeraire for the domestic investor because it is not a traded asset. So the, the martingale property somehow stays intact yeah, if the domestic investor observes the foreign market object because these are relative prices and his transformation yeah, multiplying with DFX is applied to both parts of these rel relative prices. So both approach will lead then to the same formula because you see now under the expectation operator uh, in the payoff, in the payoff, I have a multiply with FX and in the numeraire, I also have a multiply with the FX. So now in the expectation operator, this whole part, yeah, so pay one unit of currency divided by the numeraire is canceling and you just have the expectation of this object here from which I know that it is a martingale and I also know I also know the stochastic process. Yeah, So exactly the same situation, pay an index that is a martingale in units of the numeraire. So you arrive at the same formula the valuation formula value of this foreign caplet, you could express it in this first approach, the foreign caplet value times DFX, but the second approach, which is a bit nicer maybe, uh, it pays the index times the phi of D plus minus K times of phi of D minus, phi D plus minus look exactly the same. Yeah, so now it's here the ratio of the foreign rate divided by the K and everything is multiplied with my pay of unit. Maybe I should have written the P tilde also here to the end. Yeah, it's the foreign bond converted to domestic currency observed today. It's my numeraire observed at evaluation time. Multiplied here with the period length. So my next thing is the quanto caplet. And while the quanto caplet looked easier, looked a little bit, little bit simpler, it is actually now the case where things become much more complicated because this thing that the currency exchange rate cancels in the expectation 
is not happening because it is missing in the payment. So the natural payment unit is no longer natural. Uh, and really, if you if you look at the quanto, it pays a little bit unnatural. A foreign currency thing is paid suddenly in my currency. So it is unnatural. And we, we then really need a second stochastic process. And that second stochastic process is the so-called forward FX. And then you can also derive a nice analytic formula. Maybe we do this in a different session. That was it for today. Thanks.